Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. Gail Banks. To call Gail Banks an engineer would be an understatement. This is Speed School with Gail Banks. School has begun. Welcome back to Speed School Podcast, everybody. We've got a very special guest today and a lifelong friend, Walt Ware. Walt and I go back to the 70s. Early. Our careers go independently back probably into the late 50s, into the 60s. Might as so. well start in 1942, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both of our lives <laughs> started in 1942, and uh, Walt is five is it four days or five? I'm five. Five days older than I am. <laughs> I don't know uh, if, who's a Virgo and who's a... Who's I'm a, a Leo. You're a Leo, and I don't know what I am being five days later, but I, I think the end of Leo and the beginning of Virgo, it's is it? It's real close, yeah. Yeah. It's real close. I don't want to get too touchy-feely with this. I don't... I'm not into that. With this kind of stuff. Me neither. (laughs) Some people accuse me of that. (laughs) Being a Leo, I mean. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, you think. (laughs) Yeah, ladies. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of aggressive. So, but that's a good thing. You know, while I was uh, born here at Hollywood Presbyterian, uh, so I'm a Hollywood guy from a Californian from the very first. You were born in Miami? Miami. Miami. Miami Baptist. All right. Yeah. My dad helped build it, laid concrete blocks. Oh, I'll be damned. On uh, 7th Avenue, Northeast 7th Avenue. I love Avenue. connections like that. Yeah. 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 The old man works on the hospital, and Walt's born there. Yeah. Man. No, it was a, it was a, that was the church. Oh. That was the oh, church. Oh, I'm that sorry. That I was baptized in. Ah. Ah, yeah. gotcha. Gotcha. I'm going to take it right through high school, although in high school, were you into cars? Were you into, what were you into? You know, the car thing's really interesting, and I reflect back a lot on my parents and uh, I'm still amazed at how smart they were they would never let me have a car <laughs> I, I worked I had money I could pay the insurance mm-hmm. all the way well from the time I could get a worker's permit at 14 right yeah no motorcycles no cars no scooters I had to buy I bought my own bicycle <laughs> then I didn't get my first car until I graduated from Georgia Tech I'll be damned yeah you must have had a real lust going on for cars by then. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you bet. yeah, pent up kind of. You huh? know what it was? It was kind of like your Corvette, but it was two years older. It was a, it was the very first big block Chevy, nineteen sixty five and a half Chevelle SS Supersport Z sixteen. So you didn't hesitate here. No, I traded my brides of Corvair Monza in. The day I got my pay- first paycheck. <laughs> so three ninety six, four twenty seven. Right. It was three ninety six. Yeah, it was the uh, Bunk- Bunky Newton's car. You know, uh, of course, he ended up going over to Ford later on. Mm-hmm. In comparison, I wanted to drive so bad that I hot wired my mom's car while they were off for the day. And I'm not saying I didn't do a few 12 tricks. Twelve years old, I hot wired that. <laughs> I'm not saying I didn't do a few tricks, but I was not allowed to have a car. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I thought I'd tease that a little bit. <laughs> I used to ride, in junior high, I would ride my bicycle to the ex-Navy Opelika Air Base outside of Miami for the World War II, where Don Garlitz first started racing. Yes. And I was like in the, what, seventh grade. So you'd like go to the drag races. Yeah, I rode my bicycle to the drag races, yeah. But I had the, I had the bug, <laughs> and I didn't tell my parents. But I had a I had a thirty seven Ford with no engine, no transmission, that I hid in my best friend's backyard. Mm-hmm. But and I was always going to put one of the first. Remember the first Chrysler Hemi's? It was in a Desoto called yeah. Fire Dome. Yes, it was what two hundred and fifty three cubic inches or something. Yes, yeah, something like that. It's a long time ago. It was a little Hemi. Yeah, it was a little Hemi, yeah. but yeah. it was there wasn't nothing better, right? I went away to college. I came back. I don't know how my mom or dad found out. I went back to my car. It was gone. <laughs> Somebody found out. Somebody had, found it, right? <laughs> similarly, I had a 37 Chevy coupe that no engine, nothing in it. I was hiding down in Woodier uh, <laughs> near Bruce Geiser's <laughs> <This is funny. laughs> little shop, and some guys just beat the hell out of it with tire irons and God knows what. I don't know why. It was parked between two industrial buildings. Maybe they heard one. you were coming, Gail. No, I don't think anybody even knew who owned it. Anyhow, I've always wanted another 37, but 
when by you know I, I I got modern you yeah. know kind of got into overhead valves and all that drive well my so, dad's he had a 37 LaSalle business coupe mm-hmm. with like no back seat right they had the little fold down seats of course, yeah of course, absolutely of course we were a family of five right my mom and dad and three brothers when that thing finally quit and he got like a Willie's Jeep station wagon. My mom had a 49 Plymouth or something. I begged for that car, and they, they just had it towed away. Oh, and I was like 13 or 14. I said, I'll make it work. Oh, oh yeah. They were never going to let me have a car. So <laughs> 37 LaSalle was the last year of the floor shift, as I recall. This was actually three on the tree, but it was a straight okay. eight. It was a straight eight. Was it 36 then? It might have been. The last year of LaSalle floor shift was a very popular hot rod transmission. You know, well, the Lincoln Zephyr I, too, right? Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I used the LaSalle transmission behind, uh, well, in my 41 Chevy, behind a Jimmy 270 uh, in line six out of a GMC truck that was considered quite the hot rod engine if you uh, change the cylinder head to a Wayne head what they call the plank head and put multiple carburetors on it and did your header thing and your Isky or Howard cam or whatever you wanted to run but uh, too bad you didn't get that LaSalle and get to oh, man. screw with that thing yeah and so you know, I saw one in the uh, Arco station it's been a year or so fully restored I mean and it had obviously a big motor in it. yeah it was so sweet it was beautiful I just you know, I would have died to have that thing. Yeah, this was a Cadillac thing, guys, yeah. if you haven't heard of LaSalle's yeah. before. Yeah. It was kind of short-lived. But, yeah, I, I, I know a gal lives out in Redlands who has a 38. She's restoring. She's just finishing her Corvette, and now she's going to – yeah, the thing's been sitting in a barn out there, and uh, she's going to go after it. I mean, it's, like, it's an older gal. And interesting to talk to women who are into cars to the extent – that they have hands, well, you know, and, and they can make stuff happen. You, you know? know, I just ran into a, a guy. Well, because I'm always looking at cars. I was sitting at the uh, counter at the little village vault in Glendora. Yeah, I looked at a forty Ford, beautiful flame job, and I'm sitting there. So I'm just sitting there, and I'm trying to figure out whose it was. Right, I'm looking around, and some guy comes over, and he has like a a decal that you can stick on something, right? Yeah, of a forty Ford, and he says. Oh, that's my wife's car you were admiring. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful, yeah. So you graduated from high school. Where did you go? to? You went to Georgia Tech, is that I, right? I went to Georgia Tech. So Georgia Tech, rambling wreck from Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. Engineering major, I assume? M-E, double E. I'm M-E, M-E. Yeah. Oh, you uh-huh. did some double E, A little too? bit, yeah. Yeah. I did a little nuclear, and Ooh. I figured out that was not... That wasn't I your... thought it would, I thought you know this is going to be the future right and I wanted to go back and get a master's I thought this is really the future I decided not to and boy was that a good decision <laughs> <laughs> they, they, I mean it's still the right thing but what, so no, what was wrong with nuclear I couldn't come to believe that it was really going to happen in a realistic pragmatic way mm-hmm. for at least my career mm-hmm. and the other problem was of course I love cars and going fast <laughs> <laughs> so yeah now you're did four or five years at georgia tech yeah i did it in four you did it in four yeah, i did it in four yeah because you know when you pick up a little of something else it sometimes pushes you a year more mine's spread out over seven years but then i was working and earning yeah. money to go to school but this is about you walt when you came out of there I think you went into the oil industry. I did, but this is interesting background because when I graduated in 64, of course, I was maybe obsessed with automobiles, mm-hmm. and uh, Carol Shelby had just started the Cobra. Yeah. And it was with the, I think he started with the 260, but he ended up with the 289, I right. think, early production. Right. And so that was going to be my uh, first car, and I went down and drove them, and my bride said you ought to have it you've always wanted a car and i said but it costs more than a house yeah <laughs> so i didn't get the car yeah but i applied i sent a letter to carol shelby asking for a job mm-hmm. and uh i got a very polite one back that he wasn't looking for well somebody like me anyway yeah i don't think i don't think he was recruiting you know out of colleges or anything right so then uh i had a master plan Slumberjay for oil well surveying exploration people recruited really heavily at Georgia Tech. 
And there were a whole lot of reasons why I went to work for them, but not the least of which I applied for the location in Venice, California. Ah. <laughs> and guess what? Because <laughs> I figured if I got close enough, yeah. I would get the job with Carol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they sent me out in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> so I so didn't that get, didn't work out. I didn't work well, out. Yeah. I didn't work out. <laughs> so when you say Gulf, were you on drilling platforms? We were offshore. Yeah. Uh, we were all exploration. Uh, okay, uh, we, so we, you, we searched for oil. searching for it. Yeah, we searched for it because I wanted to have plenty of oil when I got my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is that done uh, with sound? How do, how would you how would you the sense? Truth is, one of the reasons that job was so interesting to me there was about five reasons if I couldn't go to work on a Cobra, but yeah. uh, the technology for oil well exploration. I mean, literally finding oil, yes. determining once you found it, if you find it, how much is there. Mm-hmm. On top of that, how producible is it? In other words, how hard is it to get it out of Mother Earth? And then the whole process of where the well is drilled, because you know they directionally drill off these offshore wells. They'll have a well, and they can go off in multiple directions yes. into different uh, leases from Got one it. from one platform. Yes. So. The very first thing we did was what you'd call GPS today, and it was based on gyroscopes. We would plot the borehole mm. actually where it was. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, yeah. they run, you know, you know how that works. So we would tell them where the hole was mm-hmm. and uh, how deep it was and all the all of the longitude, latitude, depth, et cetera. Right. So they'd know where they were. That was fascinating. And then, then we ran electrical engineering. We ran a... Uh, uh, tools that were like resistivity, mm-hmm. and you could measure. You'd send out electricity, and you measure the feedback about, you know, the resistivity of the earth, and then yeah. you can determine what's there or not there. Then we had another tool called a formation density compensated tool. We ran a nuclear pill down in the hole and sent out radioactive gamma rays yeah. and measured the feedback. So I mean, this was these guys. Wow. These guys. This was high tech. I mean, no kidding. I am totally no there kidding. with you. And we had, uh, to me, it was intellectually challenging. Besides, mm-hmm. I, I'm an outdoors guy. I'd rather be out on a rig in the middle of the ocean than, you know, behind, I never wanted to be on the, behind a desk. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to be behind the wheel or out in the woods or something. So yeah. We would have to go to the Houston headquarters, and you'd almost have to do like a doctoral dissertation. They would have a board, and they would question you on all the things you had to know to do the job uh, for the for the oil companies. Yes, and uh, it was it was harder than my college degree. So Slumberger is still very much in business. They are very much. Yeah, very much. Uh, and hopefully, <laughs> exploring for oil. I hope. Uh, I'll go back. <laughs> you know, the, the the reality of the world is, uh, dreamers seem to uh, be determining our future. And dreaming is okay as, as long as you've got some technology behind exactly. the dreams exactly. uh, rather than just dreams. Exactly. And, you know, I wanna, I'm going to out some of this stuff. I see that the, the, the press is not doing that. They're not. And uh, they're not visiting reality, uh, you know, or ICE or internal combustion engines uh, versus pure electrification. The comparisons they make are really lousy. Ford F-150 versus the Ford F-150, what do they call it, Lightning? Uh, you know, maybe a lot of guys don't realize, but the Lightning is 1,500 pounds heavier uh, because the energy density of a battery, energy per cubic foot, is nowhere near the energy density of gasoline, not to mention diesel. No which question. is the king of energy density no question. per cubic foot or per gallon, however you want to look, or, or look per, at it. Or per pound density. Wait. Yes. Mass. Or per pound. So, Volume and mass. And uh, well, the course, physics you know there. the new Hummer uh, that GM puts out? What do you think that thing weighs? 9,000 pounds. Plus. I think. Four and a half tons. Now, yeah, it's quick, but you use up that... You know, like I said, the energy density of battery is n- nowhere near. Yeah. So you're using up the energy, but you're still carrying the weight around. You, yeah. don't, you don't even burn it off, you know. Right. So you still, as the energy gets lower and lower in the battery pack and performance 
kind of diminishes, you're still pulling around the 9,000 freaking pounds. Uh, <laughs> this, this is another deal, and we'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So Don't get me started. <laughs> I, just, I just want to move you from the oil <laughs> to the turbos. Tell us how you got from Slomberger to Garrett. So how did I get from offshore oil wells to uh, turbochargers? All right. It was a torturous path because I also I, always I, I believed, hear it. I also be- always believed in turbos, as you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, as a little kid, because my dad, he always got like the magazine Popular Science and Popular Mechanics. Yes. And I read that religiously, right? So and you saw turbochargers in the, that mag, those magazines. I did, and I also, when we were young, there was always this talk about the perpetual motion machine. <laughs> yes. Remember that? Yes. So as a kid, I've always been looking for that. Yeah. And the closest I could ever get as an engineer is a it's turbocharger. A turbocharger. It, yes. You can't get closer than that. Yeah. I mean, you're taking wasted energy and turning it into power. Mm-hmm. In fact, again, back to density. Yeah, your, the point you already made with batteries yes. is a turbocharger that will make an engine do have one thousand horsepower compared to the engine yes. is like what twenty or fifty to one. The mass ratio the, between the cubic the volume and the and weight the, and the weight. Right, yes. you can take a, the what? turbocharger. In other, in other words, you got this engine; it's making <clears throat> three hundred horsepower. You turbocharge it, you can. Double the horsepower, say 600 horsepower. Easy. 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 Yeah, easy. I mean, back in the 80s, BMW had a Formula One four-cylinder engine that qualified. Well, first of all, the engine displacement, I think, was, what were they, 1,500 cc's? There was one and a half liters. One and a half liters. 1,500 cc's made 1,100 horsepower. Now, one and a half liters is like, 92 cubic inches of displacement, 1,100 horsepower. How many horsepower per cubic inch is that? <laughs> I vividly remember when Chevrolet hit one horsepower per cubic inch yes, with yes. a 283 horse, 283 yeah. in the Corvettes. Uh, I think they had to have the Rochester injection to do to that. To do that, yeah. yeah. Uh, they had a two four barrel version, which I think was two seventy horse. Well, this would be in the last year. Or so yeah, I'm trying but, to remember. You know, before they came out with the, what would the next step would be the three twenty seven. Yeah, the three twenty seven. Yeah, was, right. There was a three sixty five. No, that was a three twenty seven. The yeah. fuel injected three twenty seven. If I remember. Well, right. there was a three sixty five horse three twenty seven. I believe that was fuel injected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love those fuel injectors, but that's another. Yeah raced a lot of them at the dry lakes in Bonneville u- using the Rochesters. So, so anyway, so, with my fascination there with we go. really power density, if you want to call it that. Yeah. I mean, how do you make the most out of what you got, right? Yeah. And what God gives you, quite frankly, mm-hmm. air and fuel. Right. Okay. I never gave up on wanting to do that. And uh, obviously, Carroll Shelby wasn't interested in turbocharging Cobras at that point in time. No. To my knowledge, no. I know of one he made, and Bill Cosby ended up with that and almost killed himself in it <laughs> and sold it. Yeah. You, you know, you know, you probably know that story. Yeah, I don't know that story. Uh, well, that, somehow. So was it a 289? No, no. It was a 427 twin turbo, and he took it out on the 101, and he scared the living hell out of himself, and then mm-hmm. he just sold it. I don't know who ended up with it. Yeah. But but there's a there's we could probably research that, but I remember who, who that story. Did, who turbocharged it? It was done through Shelby cuz obviously Cosby had heard about what turbos could do and he yeah. wanted the one. Yeah. Maybe the only one. Yeah. And you know, you know how people get things they want mm-hmm. but like in that in that category though. But that was many many years later. Many. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. We decades you're, later. You're up to the Decades. The FE series engine. Yeah, decades later. Yeah. but A much larger right. engine. So I ended up, because I was fascinated with turbo machinery, I actually applied for a job at, in the automotive industry from the oil wells. That's Hurricane Betsy, which happened around September 9th, 1965, literally destroyed the Gulf. New Orleans, I mean, I mean, compared to the last really big one, I guess Irma. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were... I. 
I can't remember how many lives were lost. Yes. How many rigs were lost. How many boat trucks were lost. Yes. I was one of the last few guys in on the petroleum helicopter. Whoa. And uh, I almost didn't make it. But uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. The other part of that is my bride was sitting in a trailer park in Golden Meadow, Louisiana, which mm-hmm. there were no there were no homes there. All mm-hmm. the houses were on stilts. They didn't even have windows and doors. I'm not kidding you. You you wouldn't believe there was a place like this in America. Yeah, it was on what they call Bayou Lafourche. Mm-hmm. If you ever watched the hurricanes, they always hit a place like Grand Isle, just outside of New Orleans. They just yes. it's like a magnet, and there were no homes, and they had a you know they hired engineers. I didn't Cor- get to Cor- go. Corey Willis, are you listening to this? <laughs> Sounds like where you live. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I should know that. Hope you're smiling, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I had my new car, right? I hadn't had it very long, my Chevelle. Big block sitting there, four-speed, all that. And my bride was sitting in there with a car running, and I was nowhere to be found. Okay. It just happened that my, uh, my wonderful mother-in-law was there visiting my daughter, or her mm-hmm. daughter, and telling her, you should leave this guy because nobody who loves you should ever take you to a place like this. Uh, <laughs> yes. This is not a joke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, anyway, so they're in the car. So the helicopter came to my my rig. Yeah. And uh, there were me and a couple of guys. We threw our duffel bags on because you stay out there. You work 24 and 7 until you, yeah, you until live you're there. done. You, you live there until you're done. And you're on 24 yeah. 7 call. Yes. So. We threw our bags on, we got in a helicopter, and the guy said, well, we got one more rig, you know, one last guy. And so they went to the next rig, and these things are like, you know, 100, 150 feet off the water. Right. And they have a big, de- typical deck, like an aircraft carrier even. Mm-hmm. And so they land, and you climb up the stairs, and you get on there. So this guy got up there, and he threw his bag in, and the helicopter, I don't want to hit the table, but the helicopter, it went like, bang, and slammed back down on the deck. Yeah. So the pilot comes back and he said okay guys um we don't want to leave anybody so you got to throw all your bags off and we're going to try it again oh baby yeah man and so we did it again and the thing went over and it went like it almost touched the water <laughs> came up and then we're going in and i swear to god and, and i don't swear I, you could see that like it was a black wall coming and by the time I got to the car, they were my wife and my daughter sat with the car running, <laughs> and we just we drove 300 miles, no place to stop, right. all the way to uh, way north. Anyway, 300 miles north, going up river, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, going up river, yeah. going north. Yeah, yeah, due north. And uh, we stayed there in a motel, and the first one we could find until it was over. No water, no gas, no electric for three weeks when we got back. The trailer was spread over the bayou. I bet. I found. Uh, some of my engineering books, I found uh, not many of my trophies from sports and stuff. Yeah. I still have my Mark's engineering handbook that looks like it was in a hurricane, <laughs> <laughs> but it's precious. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, and so from there, I didn't think I should keep my bride on the bayou, and they weren't moving me to Venice, California. Right. So I applied to automotive guys. I offered from Buick, but I figured... They were going to have me designing fenders or bumpers or wheel covers. Sure. So I, I, I wasn't into that. Right. So, they sure as hell weren't turbocharging that. They sure weren't, <laughs> no. So I uh, I got an offer from McDonnell Aircraft, and we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. So I went and was a prime propulsion engineer on the F-4 Phantom. Oh, that's was, a badass aircraft. A, and we made it better. It was because of the Vietnam War, the way it was, and people are familiar I mean, we, at that stage, in our military program, we did not have what you would call dogfight airplanes. Mm -hmm. We had, I mean, the F-4 Phantom is a big bird. Yes, it is. It's basically a missile and nuclear platform. Right. I mean, it's not armed other than big missiles. No gun. Yeah, it's not armed. So we had to convert this to fight against MiG because China got their MiGs from Russia. So you were at McDonald. I was at McDonald Aircraft. So you, St. Louis. Do you, do you guys put a gun on the thing? We put cannons on there. Yes. My job was we had to turn it into a dogfighter. My mm-hmm. job, I had to re-engineer the total fuel system to pull all the G's in every maneuver. Uh, yes. To fight a, a MiG nineteen or a MiG twenty one. So one of the things that made the German air- aircraft in World War Two better than ours was direct cylinder fuel injection versus a carburetor. Right. And right. Uh, negative Gs. Right. 
we couldn't pull negative G's like they could. Mm-mm. So that was a tremendous disadvantage. On the fuel system, was it negative G loading an issue? Oh, yeah. Well, every maximum G's and you know, negative G's. Mm-hmm. I mean, rolls and turns and dives and you know all the things you do. I mean, like, like Maverick, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff, only in a huge bird. It was tremendous. And so you made it turn as we made it turn and dive and roll, climb. Yeah. <laughs> so so you still have the disadvantage of the size mass. and weight, size yeah. and weight, and yeah. just pure mass, wing loading. Yeah. All of but that. then we had uh, we had GE J seventy nine jet engines mm-hmm. a pair. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were, we had essentially six o'clock in the morning meetings with GE at least once a week. Yeah. Every week without fail. Because there were obviously the fuel system was related to the engine system. Beyond that, there were when we put the mini cannons, the twenty millimeter cannons, and all that on the airplane. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got in a thing where the gas from firing the cannons would go through the air intakes into the engine oh, and great. starve oxygen. As yes. you well yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of <laughs> density, we'll save that. Yeah, for, yeah. We'll save that for later. Yeah. We had to re-engineer the airlines. We had to engineer it for all the G maneuvers. Essentially, an acrobatic yeah. airplane. The other problem was that even these these were Mach two point four plus airplanes, mm-hmm. so you couldn't hear them coming, you couldn't see them coming, mm-hmm. but they had a serious smoke problem. Black smoke, you know, yeah. like you so and the I, engine the things you and I don't like. Yeah. Unburnt fuel. Yeah, okay. the engine efficiency. But you could, they could see the smoke trail of course. and use ground to air and shoot yeah. the big birds down. Yeah. And you that's got, also related to the fuel. Did GE clean them up? Well, that's we had meetings at 6 o'clock in the morning until we solved the problem. So we were working on smoke abatement, right? aerobatic capabilities, mm-hmm. firing guns with hot gas that went through the air intake system. I mean, this was a hell of an engineering program, yeah. right? And this is before computers. Yes. This is all before computers. Yes. Okay. In yeah. fact... It's amazing, amazing how... Uh, intuition works there. Yeah, slide rules and uh, yeah. This was for handheld right. calculators too. Of course. The one thing we had, I'm sure you've seen these. I had one at home. I don't know if I still have it anymore because I've moved a lot. But remember the Frieden calculator? Oh my God! You it, you could calculate out to 17 decimal points. Mm-hmm. It was like the, it was like this big. It looked like a huge typewriter. That's what I used. <laughs> there were Whoa. no computers. Right and. But you wanted accuracy. You wanted accuracy. Yeah. And so it's kind of a social study, if you will. But McDonald was in St. Louis, Missouri, mm-hmm. and they had the Aircraft Workers Union. And so, and they were, you know, very strict and all that. But, you know, I had deadlines to meet, and you had to have a, like a union clerk, like move equipment around in the office. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't touch it. Yeah. But I did. Of course. You did. <laughs> so we ended up. I ended up with grievances because I was going to get the job done, right? Yeah. Well, you know, that, <laughs> did you get time slip? Did anybody? Did they do that. I got whatever. Where you do? I got the, yellow slips or something. What do you? Whatever. Call? I mean, pink, I didn't get a pink. I didn't get gets, a pink slip. That's when you're gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Audio. <laughs> so. But but anyway, you have a job to do, right? I don't. There's, exactly. an, there's another aircraft in your career. Uh, was it? The next aircraft. That was the next project, yeah. But a different company, Pratt & Whitney? Yeah, yeah. There's one more thing, and I think it's fine for this podcast. But uh, yeah, I had a, for it. I had another uh, interlude with the union. Uh-huh. So, um, and my wife and I both worked at uh, McDonald. She worked in the space building, and I worked in the, the aircraft building. Yeah. Right? On the same, we're all in the St. Louis air, airport perimeter. Mm-hmm. I mean, we tested out of there. Yes. Um uh, Actually, there's two stories that are historically significant. Uh, and Old Mac was still there. It's before it became McDonnell Douglas and all those things. It was, yes, just it was Old Mac. And he would get on the loudspeaker and he would say, <laughs> this is Old Mac. <laughs> and we just did whatever it was we did. Yeah. You know? And uh, it was cool, right? When it was cool. I get a loudspeaker? This is old Gail. There you go. No, I can't. I mean, I still remember this. I mean, Honest I was a kid. God. When I was 20-something, yeah. right, right out of college. So what happened at McDonald was, after we got the, we solved all the problems, I mean, and the program was really successful. I mean, the pilots were really happy. They weren't getting shot down from the ground, and they were able to 
be effective even you know against MIGs. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously there's there's a whole difference, you know, but uh, they certainly were competitive. They're way more survivable, right, and so, lethal. Then McDonald got a new contract, yep. and it was a whole new top secret thing, right? So you know me, I applied for a job, <laughs> and so I applied for the job, and I didn't get the job, and I wasn't happy. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, Pratt and Winnie came to town, and they had a big hotel downtown. And uh, I went down and interviewed, and I got a job on the Blackbird. <laughs> wow! So West Palm Beach, Florida, research and development, and uh-huh. working on the Blackbird. Right. Folks, that's the SR seventy one. And uh, <laughs> interesting. After I turned in my resignation, they said, "Oh, well, we thought about it. You know, and we'd really like you to work on this program." And I said, "I'm sorry, I'm going to go work on the Blackbird." Uh, yeah, <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a dream, right? I mean, if I could, it would have been for anybody. If, if I could, that probably should top turbos, right? I think that it probably tops anything. I mean, you I start think, talking about the Blackbird. I was in St. Louis. You went back to Florida? I went back to West Palm Beach, Florida, which yeah. where my whole family was, which was... That had to be cool. That was beautiful. Yeah. That was truly beautiful. We still didn't have children, so I was trying to find my career job, actually. What yeah. I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Exactly. I'm, I'm kind of like that. You know, I'm... Mm-hmm. I'm I'm just, I don't know, I get committed to things. Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't give up easy. Yeah. So anyway, but my wife and I both, they gave her a job too. Uh-huh. So we're both working at Pratt & Whitney. That was really exciting. And I don't know how much you want to save that for another one, because that's a whole. Actually, we could talk a bit about. Okay. Well, this, this is what's fascinating. Because I think if, you, if you're into automotive performance, you're probably uh, into SR71s. I'm just, I have not met a guy. Who doesn't go, oh, my God, that's a badass airplane. All these years later, the stuff, you got to tell the audience about what you did in engine development, what that spike is sticking out the front of the okay. engine, okay. how that came to be. When I was at, when was at your birthday the other night, mm-hmm. um, Dave, he knew a lot about SR-71 and the Blackbirds. Yeah. So we got all the way off on that for a long, long time. And he's the first person I've ever met who ever heard of a YF-12A, which was one of a kind Mm -hmm. interceptor version of the Blackbird. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a fighter Blackbird. The Air Force Mm -hmm. was Mm -hmm. exerting Mm -hmm. some Mm -hmm. power trying Mm -hmm. trying to. Nobody knew about it. It happens to be the license plate for my old Cayenne. It's this YF-12A. Nobody is old. (laughs) I know know what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Back to that. I got there as a you know young engineer, right? Mm-hmm. They had the Blackbird, the J58 engine at that time, had uh, multiple in a circumferential arrangement mm-hmm. burner cans, mm-hmm. uh, cylindrical, which all of the air from the compressor uh-huh. or the ram air, mm-hmm. ver- by virtue of the spike, depending on what altitude and speed, Mach number and all yeah. that, goes either through or bypasses the compressor and ends up in the burner can. So this thing, first of all, to me, that looks like a whittle. There's similarity. There is similarity. Yeah, when you see that engine, Mm -hmm. that whittle developed in England, Mm -hmm. uh, World War Mm -hmm. II-ish, and then you look at your engine, that is very similar looking. But your project went from a conventional jet engine subsonic and maybe it may maybe part way into the supersonic mm-hmm. range and then it transitioned into a ramjet essentially a air breathing ramjet yeah right mm-hmm. no it was not like a solid fuel ramjet or something no. like that i mean this, no. this was an air breathing internal combustion engine mm-hmm. right what happens is i'll just go back to kind of like my engineering 101 assignment when i got there yeah so here i am a kid you've heard about the people are familiar with the blackbird know about when it does unstarts I mean, you're literally flying, and you make some kind of a maneuver. Mm-hmm. If the air going into the engine is in the right relationship it, with the spike, it unstarts. So it stops. An oblique angle type, right. type of thing. Yeah. It chokes yeah. in, mm-hmm. in turbocharger technology. It just yes. chokes. There's no air, yeah. so you can't burn fuel, right? So it's so, an unstart, not a flame out. It's essentially the same thing. Yeah. They're essentially the same thing. Okay. But it's really violent in a Blackbird. <laughs> oh. It's really violent. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the whole thing goes. You know. Yeah. So the plane, you could you could get unstart. The other thing was I was responsible for, as soon as I got there, everything from the 
where the compressor ended to where the burnt combustion fuel went into the turbine yes okay and then and then there was the turbine and then there was the afterburner section yeah so if you look at it there'd be in this case because of this the very high supersonic mock what 3.4 maybe a little more uh-huh. uh you had to control the air coming in we still did it on the on the f4 phantom we had we had ramps got it but uh so you control the air before it hits the compressor you put you pressurize it within the compressor and then it goes through the tr- the hot section mm-hmm. and then it goes into the turbine and in the case of afterburn sometimes you bypass that and go directly you know into the afterburner right so there's like all these stages so in those days we pretty much engineering and all new developments you did things in pieces mm-hmm. modules we'd call them right so you work like heck I and mean, they had to ultimately marry the whole thing from end to end right so you had the initial air entry into the engine. Yeah, I got the air from the compressor, mm-hmm. and I gave it scorching red hot to the turbine. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. And the limit of that airplane, in fact, all jet engine airplanes, in fact, almost everything is, as you know, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but everything is metal temperature limited. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So absolutely. So some of the secrets to that Secrets, which are no longer secrets, they've been all unveiled, but was Pratt and Whitney was very astute at developing metallurgy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the turbine blades were made of some things called wasp alloy, which was a patented proprietary thing. Yep. The burner cans were made out of Haft alloy X. You could go on and on and on. Everything yeah. in there was the secret. The only way you could get that power density was heat. Exactly. That's where all energy comes exactly. from, ultimately, even you and I. But I even mean, when even I eat like, lunch, I get hot afterwards. Right? <laughs> because you're, yeah. It's, so the uh, compressor speed and therefore the compressor pressure ratio capabilities were limited by heat. And the exotic alloys l- let you gain some speed and therefore performance right. that we, you wouldn't have had. We it let the turbine do more work. Like we, mm-hmm. when we look exactly. at turbine work in a turbine. Same, yeah. It's the same. The I'm going engine, through it right now. Yeah, the my, jet engine was a really giant turbocharger, yeah. basically. <laughs> That's why I did it. <laughs> okay. It was a giant turbocharger. Yeah, you're getting close to turbocharger. <laughs> I'm working now. my way. Yeah. I, I don't give up easy. So. Yeah. Anyway, I got there, and uh, – I'm a kid, right? I was 20. What, what could I have been? 23 or 4? Yeah. These burner cans, of which, as I recall, I still have in storage a full-scale cross-section drawing of the engine. It's a, yes. It's, it's a large I'm going to bring it. You need a bigger table. I'm going to yeah. bring it in. i I got to go to storage. I have so much stuff in storage. Uh, yeah. I have a museum. What was that spike called that moved in and out? So uh, is that spike part of the unstart? Absolutely. The spike actually, this translating spike actually moved 42 inches. So that's it's three and a half feet. Yeah, yeah. It could go in and out. And the whole idea was. Now, this is in the center of the air inlet for the engine. Yeah, it's a spike. Yeah. yeah. And it's conical. I mean, it's spherical, conical, tapered. Mm-hmm. And it so basically. So that would prevent, uh, it sh- I want to say shock. The, yeah, it, could, it prevents the shock from happening in the wrong place. Right. You get an unstart if it happens in the wrong place. Absolutely. It just chokes. There's there's no air. So, well, I mean, the you air get, density becomes yeah, yeah. very rare. Very non-existent, air, right? Yes. And it's very it's thin shock. up there anyway. Mm-hmm. Think about air at 100,000 feet. It's oh so thin. It's yeah. super thin. Yeah. Okay. But the, this thing moved 42 inches from everything that... I know and, and can remember. That, right. It's a long time ago. Yes. But, but I remember 42 inches. I'm pr- pretty good on numbers. That moved in and out, okay, depending on speed and altitude, you know, density, because you, you got it's always compensating. Absolutely. You're, you're always working on density yeah. and, you and got not all choking. These balls in the air controlling that, uh, yeah. that spike. Yeah. The interesting thing about my job as a kid, if you want to call it that, a kid engineer, was I got there and these burner cans, and there were a half a dozen of them around radially. Yes. You know, so all the air went through them and out, but there were voids in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to talk about all the stuff that goes on inside the cans and outside the cans. And I mean, I mean, these cans themselves were engineering masterpiece. Mm-hmm. But more than pure engineering, basically, 
hands-on. I call you might even call it intuitive, using all the tools you got, but no computers, right? Right. <laughs> no CFD, no mm-hmm. solid modeling, none right. of this stuff. I actually used a water table, mm-hmm. transparent water table, and flowed compressible fluid through the cans to try to understand how the air was going through the cans. Oh, okay, uncompressible. Water is uncompressible, right? right. That's but air fluid. is compressible, right? Yeah. Did yeah. I say it wrong? You said compressible fluid. I meant uncompressible. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you're sitting now. You're trying to make you know in your brain how does air work versus mm-hmm. an incompressible fluid water? Absolutely. And you can see bubbles, and we ran colors. You know, we did. I mean, this is how we did it in the yes. old right? Yes. I mean, it's just how you did it, right? Anyway, I did all that because. One of the things I had to do is I had to control very close, very accurately, the combustion flame front out of the can mm-hmm. and how it entered the turbine blade. Yes. Because, again, centrifugal force, I know you know this, but the centrifugal well, force, the blades always wants to fly off the hub, right? Absolutely. So you can't have it too hot at the hub. So you're talking about you, the heat distribution. Yeah, it's got to be as cold as you can make it at the hub and as hot as you can make it out at yeah. but the tip, Yeah. right? Strong as possible at that right, hub. right, and then you had a special metal because the limit of that airplane speed was the engine, and the limit of that was the metal in the turbine blades, right? Because the turbine drives the compressor on and on and on, like yes. the thing we already said. Yes. So I'm sitting here in the middle. I'm making the heat. <laughs> yeah. So I had to deal with Parker Hannifin, the fuel nozzle people. I had to do all of that stuff. One of the things that happened, which was a basic engineering structural vibrational analysis thing, was. I almost have to draw it to talk about it, just because well, my, my can't see it. So my head, but yeah, but I have bet, to yeah. I have to do it. Oh, I have, okay, I have to yeah. do it to talk. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so the the can. This is very so crude. Got this is front, very crude. Front view and a side view. Yeah, and so so inside here is another thing called a center tube. Air goes around here and through here, and fuel fuel gets put in all around here. Right? So around the perimeter. So of the you got tube. your and ultimately yeah. you got your flame. I need more paper, but you get a flame Excellent. coming out the back. Yeah. So the function of the center tube is what? It's to control the airflow. Okay. okay. See, the air comes in here. It's very complex. Yes. It's, it's, I mean, I, 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 I get that. I'm very doing calling very. Calling it a can. Air's is, coming in here. It, calling this thing a can is an insult. Yeah. But we call yeah. it a burner can. That reminds me of a revolver. You know, you see these tubes, which is where you put the cartridges. So it's kind of a gun analogy. Yeah. Well, the cartridges are actually fuel nozzles. Got it. So you're putting the hydrocarbons, which is a good word to me, yeah. in, yeah. and you're yeah. bringing the air in from the compressor. Yes. And, and then you control That's so the, the BTUs out takes, the back. Yes. Got it. And a profile that doesn't melt the turbine. Mm-hmm. So, so the I'm compressor really. is before this. Mm-hmm. The, yeah, the, yeah, the compressor is up here, and the turbine's back here. Mm-hmm. And then the spike is way up there. Got it. So yeah. the spike. I, I'm better if I can draw, but the spike I, I, determines <laughs> the air comes off the spike. Yeah, prevents. And you want it in the engine. You don't. You, you don't. Know, you it, you don't want it. Yeah. Shocked away. Yeah, the shock. Yeah. If a shock profile forms, right. It's deflecting air density away from the uh, engine's inlet. So by moving the spike in and out, you can optimize the face loading. Of the air inlet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. By face loading, I mean the density uh, across that inlet. Yeah. And yeah. going back, Gail, even to you know the things you and we're familiar with 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 our high speed record cars, ram air. Absolutely. You're actually well, you're actually pre compressing the air before the compressor. Yes. With speed. Exactly. Okay. So it's it's all related. Yeah. To power and speed and air and, and fuel. You know what a freak I am for ram yeah. air. So. <laughs> well, yeah, there's two of us. <laughs> How do you use that free energy? That's the poor man's supercharger. Ram air is the poor man's supercharger. Exactly. Yeah, we are so, both. We're in sync. Absolutely in sync. We've been, we've been on parallel paths forever. You know, every time I see an air filter on, on the mouth of a turbo... Or an air filter under on, the hood on a stick, uh, you know, piece of tube, and then I go nuts. But uh, under the hood, I'm going. That's the Duh. highest <laughs> level of stupidity. Uh, it, it's ignorance. I mean, stupidity is the wrong word. Guys that do that are ignorant of how much horsepower they're actually giving away. Okay. 
I'm going to go offline real quick, but it's same, totally related. I just this morning got – you'll see it because I think you get the same information. But uh, they – the guys, what are they? LSR have taken a C8 Corvette, uh-huh. twin-turboed it, using EFI as a secondary – Fuel injection control yeah. superimposed, you know, on the over stop. over the direct yeah. injection. So engine. when you yeah. you know all this stuff, but when it goes into boost, the EFI takes over a secondary fuel thing, right? Yeah, and then they have a picture of it. I mean, it's cool. I mean, it did eight eighty three and one sixty one in the quarter. Mm-hmm. The guy supposedly drives it every day. So I look at the picture. So I'm looking at it, and I watch the video. I send it to my son Lance because <laughs> yeah. we we have one, or we have one. It's paid for. It's in New Hampshire. We got to go get it. I got gotcha. you. We can't get papers on it. So, but we're tight. You own it. We own it. Yeah. Paid you for. Gotta, yeah. And we're titling it in Montana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I want to put twin turbos on it. <laughs> okay? Sure. Oh, of course. <laughs> so I look, and so they have the the guy. It's a nice video, and he opens the the rear deck where the mid-engine is, yeah. and he's got the air cleaners under the hood. <laughs> and I'm like, duh, right? right. I mean, like, the, can't you? The exhaust system, the turbines. Everything. Yeah, I mean, the big hot there. turbos are it's hot in there. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's nuts. But, but I mean, the thing goes, but but, well, what, but he's know, throwing it away. Since we're talking about the C8 and turbocharging, I, I get the fuel system. You, you, you've got basically another... ECU. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's controlling the fuel. I don't know who's controlling the timing. I mean, there's ways to to control the timing, which is uh, the parent ECU from GM is doing all that. So you're keeping the air fuel correct, but I think they, these guys are getting snake bit in other ways because everyone I've seen that's had this moment of glory. Has had this moment of failure. See, I, you don't. I haven't read that. They are killing but, the engines, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I imagine it's detonation, killing the pistons. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. And why would it? Why would it detonate? First thing is, where's the charge air cooling, and how much of it is there? And and it, it is it because if you put two turbos on, that looks nice, but you got to put charge air cooling somewhere and that naturally aspirated engine didn't have that system so where do you put it how do you evaluate that it's performing correctly so you start with hot air you run it into the compressors because you were lame and you put the air air filters and then you multiply the heat (laughs) well so like you sent the air filters to hell and then you you take that intake air temperature from hell you run it into the compressor you add more hell (laughs) And you're trying to get air density, but you've already subtracted a bunch. So the compressor has to make up just to, to get to the ambient air density. And then it goes beyond that. But the compressor discharge temperature and the compressor impeller temperatures are going for the frickin' moon. I submit that if you run them more than a quarter mile, if you go to Bonneville with this setup, you, you may put the compressor impellers in the charge air cooler. And hopefully it filters out all the big oh, yeah. pieces, oh, yeah. and it doesn't get to the engine. Right. But the thing is, you're causing your detonation problem in, in some respect. Yeah, you're seeding it by yeah. being so damn ignorant about your air inlet temperature. Not and you're. De- I also submit that the air inlet pressure into the compressor is compromised. You're not getting any ram air at all. No. No. So the air getting into the engine bay, I mean, you're pulling a lot of CFM out of that engine bay. Well, how the hell does the air get into the engine bay? Isn't there a belly pan under the engine? I mean, I don't own a C8, but I'm just saying. It's hypersonic gray, by um, the way. Let's, let's just make sure you get, <laughs> I got the damn, color right. you get that damn C8 out here. Hi, hypersonic gray. There you go. I picked the color. <laughs> no. Anyhow, the, the whole deal is... Higher temperature kills. <laughs> low, you're making the compressor work beyond its design point. If you're going to get, you know, everybody looks at manifold pressure like that is a golden thing, a boost, boost. They don't know anything about temperature. They don't know where the hell they are for air density. And the engine pumps cubic feet of air. What's the air density per pounds, cubic foot? Pounds. <laughs> pounds of air per cubic foot. Not p- 
pounds of boost pressure, which doesn't even include the ambient pressure. It's, it's a gauge reading. So you've left off a whole bunch of... Uh, Remember that really old crude thing you and I used to do? I mean, I think it probably goes back to the 70s mm. when we just kind of said, look, uh, 10 pounds of air with the right amount of fuel is 100 horsepower. Yes. I mean, that's totally un- I mean, yeah. we're obviously not more, real scientific, we're but a, lot, a rule of but, thumb. But it's just a rule. But it's 10 pounds of air per 100 horsepower. That, that speaks to air mass to fuel mass or air fuel ratio. It's not 10 pounds of boost per 100 horsepower. No. It, 10 pounds it's of not boost. Not 10 PSI. To, to me, 10 pounds of boost, it's an almost dimensionless number. I agree. Because you don't know the humidity, you don't know the pressure. You only know part of the pressure. At least the guys in Europe Gauge talking, pressure. <laughs> you know, you, one bar of the pressure, which is ambient pressure, you're not even considering. You're breaking even. <laughs> you know, so you have to know absolute pressure. You have to know relative humidity. And you have to know temperature. And that's what you're putting in the intake manifold. You, the, the, those are the factors necessary to compute the air density per cubic foot and the engine pumps cubic feet. Not pounds of boost, it pumps cubic feet. The n- number you want is inlet air density. And then the volumetric efficiency, which is antiquated term also, mm-hmm. is the process from the intake manifold, usually from ambient air to the cylinder. When I talk volumetric efficiency, I'm thinking naturally aspirated. Mm-hmm. But all we care about is how much density we get in the intake manifold, how much, how much dens- of that density translates through the ports, past the valves, and into the cylinder. That that gets there is what you mix the fuel with. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Pounds of boost is so exactly. lame. But guys go around, they are ignorant. Well, uh, So th- it's up to us, and I re- really feel it's up to us, to really get the word out on what a wonderful tool a density measuring system is. I know. Is. I couldn't agree more. I, it's I, the gold standard. Yeah. I mean. Because you, you'll know, hey, I'm killing the turbocharger, or oh, I don't have enough charge air cooler. You know all of this stuff. Instead, these guys put these things together. The magazine guys talk all about them like it's God-given. Then they blow them up. And I can only surmise uh, it's a huge detonation issue or it's a structural issue. Yeah, thermal, structural, Be- yeah, mechanical. Yeah, the engine structure I'm talking about. So, yeah. you know, we, we develop engines that run hundreds of, or thousands of hours at full power and don't kill themselves. How the hell do we get there? And how the hell have we won records and, you know, endurance won races, records. run endurance records. Too. Yeah, championships, yeah. Uh, that kind of stuff for 50, 60 years now. I, you know, we're both 80. Uh, we wanna, <laughs> that makes 160. We want to start, you know, to me, I want to see the enthusiasm around internal combustion continue. And one way to keep it going is tell people how we did it. Right. You know, efficiency. We're all we're talking about yeah, efficient but, use of but, what nature gave us. If God. you listen to the old men, you'll save money and make more horsepower. And have because cleaner. we're surprisingly hip old men. And be cleaner too, yeah. by the way. Oh yeah. If you do it if right. If you burn the fuel in the right. engine, you don't put it into the atmosphere. Because we both know there's a whole lot yet to be done with fuels with the internal combustion engine. Uh, oh. That's virtually almost guys are patenting stuff for internal yeah. combustion. Right now, right now. I mean, uh, uh, Toyota recently revealed a uh, patent for a new diesel fuel injector. It blends air right at the point of injection, gives you better air density, and uses more of the combustion space, but better air density and air fuel at the center of the chamber. So I want to pick up, also, putting the density in, you got to be really careful about what happens after it comes out the other end Mm -hmm. back pressure yes delta p across the engine oh you could put all kinds of boost in the front and if you can't (laughs) get it the hell out you can lose well that might be another problem on the c8 so i have you've augmented i've done no system engineering i just saw a picture when you put a turbocharger on you augment the intake and you uh 
put a cork in the exhaust, so to speak. Yep. The valve timing has got to be different. Now you're back to the detonation and everything else. Although you'll get some internal EGR. Well, <laughs> you get internal EGR, but you don't want by restricting the exhaust flow exactly. of the turbines. Exactly. But these guys celebrate the fact that they made so much horsepower that they killed the engine. No, they didn't make so much horsepower that they killed the engine. No, 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 no. They're unaware of their f- up. They're absolutely, totally unaware of it, blissfully unaware of it, and they celebrate the engine destruction. I mean, first time I found a really knowledgeable top fuel engine builder because I, w- I wanted to know if they've got their little rules of thumb, et cetera, et cetera, and I wanted to do a top fuel. Uh, I remember that program back in the 80s i remember that <laughs> and that's another that's a podcast too so i'm just looking at yeah. amg a- amg has become its own company amg is fully fully engaged in retaining the v8 engine they made an in, announcement in, in amg vehicles well, you know i have one yeah i know you do but th- <laughs> this is right now looking at, at the data on what amg has done with the v8 and of course there's turbocharging involved. There's hybrid involved. There's electric propulsion involved. Uh, there's just quite a bit of technology going on. Those guys at AMG, you know, they were an aftermarket company hot rodding uh, Mercedes Benz product. And then Mercedes Benz bought them. And now they are their own brand uh, within, within a- the world of Mercedes Benz. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're optimizing a four-cylinder and a V8 engine. And one of the factors in the optimization uh, is a torque fill turbocharger. In other words, diminishing turbo lag. Uh, they, and of course these turbochargers turn uh, well in excess of 100,000 so RPM. The smaller ones are 200. Yeah. yeah. And they've got a very narrow electric motor within them and it does torque fill like you can't believe, coming off the mark Mm -hmm. or squeezing it at speed, it just does it. Walt did this at Garrett. A long time ago. (laughs) Like 40 years ago. In the laboratory. Yeah. Yeah. So when we get into Walt and Garrett and the racers and the engines we were developing and Smoky Eunuch and Indianapolis and Bonneville. Mario Andretti and Can-Am. Oh, Can-Am and Boats. <laughs> uh, there, there's so much more for us to talk about. Th- this could be multiple segments. Don't forget the Turbodyne electric boost. And the Turbodyne electric boosting. Uh, it was an electric centrifugal supercharger that we used on the push truck for the Teague Welsh and Bank Streamliner at Bonneville to make that Cummins come to life quickly. Breathe. <laughs> and, and, you know, the Cummins was turbocharged. Cummins dually push truck, that we, or Dodge, Ram, whatever you called it back then. That was another company that Walt ran. Let's do the burner cans. I'm going to finish that. Yeah, yeah it, but I want to get you to California is what I want to do here. So Okay. Go so, ahead. What are we, 20-something years old? I get there. And so they, I mean, they're all these senior guys, right? So. Yeah. Anyway, I'm a junior, whatever, experimental engineer. So they come to me and they say, well, you know, we got this problem. These burner cans are breaking the center tube off Mm -hmm. to be edited. In old school lingo, toxic male, they call it a donkey. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. yeah. The thing would, would resonate and break and go through the damn turbine. Yeah, you just, bought, you just bought a freaking engine. Or maybe an airplane. Yeah. Or And some pilots, right? Yeah. So here I am. I'm a kid. I don't know why they haven't solved it. So they say, oh, your first job, we have this problem. I can only assume because I have other, other jobs like that when I got older is there were problems that nobody ever solved for whatever reason. Let's I don't try know. it on this guy. I, I, I don't know why. Yeah, let's see if this two kids, it's like, kids or they got say, anything going. Oh, we tried that before and that won't work. You heard that one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been through that so many that's times another, in my life. Oh, we tried that. That won't work. So so I'm there and I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do? You know, these guys are, they're all seen, they all smarter than me, right? They're experienced. Mm-hmm. So I get this damn thing and I'm thinking, damn. Ran the engines. I had thermal couples in the engines. I had, you know, all kinds of instrumentation, as much as you could have then. We had a thing, we called it a slip ring. 
we could run wires from rotating machinery certain ways to, yes. to a slip ring right and then take it out you know indirectly yes. 48 channels that was a max yeah and it was on the nose of the engine uh-huh. you know where it was cool and we had thermocouples and pressure sent all the stuff you could do i run this thing and i'm so i'm measuring the temperatures all over this damn can right mm-hmm. okay so i know the temperature so the thing must be getting weak enough that something's exciting it and it's low cycle fatigue sure I mean, you know. Yes. So, this like the charger. like the Cotonic Bridge thing, you yeah. know, from Engineering Mechanics 101. So then I instrumented everything, and they had a kind of a development lab, and they had a big shaker table. You've seen them. Oh yeah. These things like like a, a huge beer keg, right? Yes. I mean, you could put a lot of energy. So then I take this burner can with that I've had in the engine with all the thermocouples, so I knew the temperatures, right. and then I put it on the shaker cable, mm-hmm. and then I wrapped this thing in all kinds of different ways with inductive heating, mm-hmm. so I could get the metal to the to temperature, that, the operating and then temperature. I shake the living hell out of it, right? right. You're not gonna believe this, I, I, I need to go back. I mean, I have a really good memory for numbers, and that engine, when it was running full power, basically ran steady state, 6,000 RPM at the turbine level. Yeah. Okay. You got your energy, extra energy. You know, that was enough to drive the compressor. Mm-hmm. You had RAM. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, the compressor just got in the way, honestly. Yeah. It just got yeah. in the way. So you bypassed yeah. it. It's like okay? a throttle. But it still yeah. went through the burner cans. Okay? Yeah. And you had. And then you turn on the afterburn. Six bypass passages. Yeah. And then we had three stages of afterburn, which was the rocket. Yeah. That was the, the scram jet part. Right. It was kind of amazing to me. So then I go through this. You know what happened? You get to the right temperature. And you go tune in on the equivalent of 6,000 RPM, the right. number cycles per second, yeah, shaking. Well, well, yeah. Broke the freaking things. Now, first order would be 6,000 hertz. Yeah. The so, engine. In. So I kept messing around with getting the metal temperature yeah. as close as I could that it really saw in the engine mm-hmm. and shaking it and then trying to shake it through ranges of the engine that might have excitation. You got it. It is. You found it happened. The, you found the natural frequency of yeah. the hot metal. And I broke the suckers. Yeah. So now I got to fix them, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but but still, if, if you can't break it, you can't fix it. Mm-hmm. You know. We, we well, know. you have to find. You have to go break failure. just like you're doing with the Duramax. You got to find what breaks, so you can fix it. I'm having a hard time finding things that break. I've on been the following that. That's, yeah. be, that's beautiful thing though. We've been on so much military mm-hmm. stuff that killing a Duramax. I, I needed that dyno for some military work. It was mission critical. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, that goes somewhere We're going else, back to but, tr- try to break it. You, you, you know this, but I'll re- my son's boat holds the record for diesel boats from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Queen Mary. Oh, the, I know that. The diesel record. Yeah. That's with Cummins 6.7s, 5.50s. Right. Factory. So anyway, then I went through this whole mechanical engineering, structural vibration. I had made all these structural changes. I actually had to put reinforcing like struts like you might oh absolutely i'm visualizing it already yeah yeah you can see yeah it. i can and see then it. i had to figure out how many and where to place and yeah. they couldn't mess up the airflow exactly right and they couldn't create a new problem you had to change the natural frequency and at they can't change they can't create a new problem right right because wherever you mount them it might tear well it, if I you mean, get the natural frequency high enough that you never get there right. push it way up yeah that, so that, that was like my first assignment yeah. At Pratt & Whitney. But so we, you also ran the testing program out in the Everglades. We did. We ran the engines, and we had one day a week we rotated, and we got to run, we ran them at night. So we, we ran a night shift, a midnight shift. Yeah. And then we had the next day off, so I, we'd all go hunting or fishing. <laughs> but anyway. Some of the pictures, you, you can find pictures on the Internet taken of Walt and the guys running the engines at night. At night. Uh, what would you call those? The sonic diamonds? The diamonds. Are yeah. they, what do they call them? That's sonic Shock. diamonds. That's sonic where, diamonds. Every time it breaks the sound, speed of sound, it makes a diamond. Right. You should see that in the exhaust pattern you should, uh, in those photographs. You should feel it in your body. I'll bet it thumps it's, it. You know how Formula out. One is? I mean, it yeah. makes all your internal organs. Well, how about top fuel? Same thing. Yeah. 10,000? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Liquefied. I, I, went, I went this year in February. You take somebody to... The digs out here at Pomona, uh, and they're running the fuelers. We go up to the auto club. They have a trackside suite up at the top of the stands, one of those, and big sheet glass. And through the glass, you feel it, just hitting you right in the chest. You know, you get a a young guy who's – or even – 
young girl. I did. Uh, you know, you <laughs> you bring your kids in there, and they they witness that and experience that, and it's like they're absolutely blown away by the sheer. Forget about video games, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, we just did. Me, uh, my daughter, uh, my granddaughter. You know, my daughter is a CFO or a COO, Chief Operating Officer, kind of runs the whole show. Her daughter wanted to go into, well, she she's a hell of a horsewoman. She is, in her age group, she's like number three in the country. They go all over. Uh, they base out of Florida. So they're in Florida a lot. Uh, the, 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 my two granddaughters, they both are wonderful equestrians. Well, here, one of them is now... 16 she came to the duramax factory tours that we did and of course i was there last sunday and and did the factory tour with brookville that new plant they're doing mm, kind of west of dayton, west of dayton i drove uh, lockjaw in, into that you know they had a car show so i was there i was there it was late one night it was i don't know why i was down here it was like 8.30 or 9.30, and the lights were on, and the garage door was open. Oh, here at the shop. I had to go back to my office. I'd forgotten something. Yeah. So I came in, and I opened the gate and came in, and the guys are in there working. We've got to get it ready to go to Ohio tomorrow morning or something. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing thunders to the ex- extent we did some mufflers that uh, aren't restrictive, but took the spikes off of the exhaust because it's like – Awesome. If you're within like 30 or 40 feet of that thing and I whack the throttle. It hurts. <laughs> oh, holy God. And it's Sharp. screamingly quick response. Like a well, light it's under switch. under boosted idle, isn't it? it yeah. <laughs> we, we, we had to diminish the boosted idle, actually. The boost air was getting too hot. Well, they told me you couldn't do it too long or it would overheat because it was putting so much. Well, now we're bypassing air to atmosphere. Okay. Something, okay. We, something we did on the dragster okay. uh, years ago. Blowing it off. Same yeah. deal. Yeah. yeah. So she's been studying, uh, she's a wonderful student, very focused, and I thought, you know, her grandfather uh, on her father's side was a medical doctor in, in the Fresno, and he was a stunning MD, especially on the radiology right. side I of things. I forgot that. I forgot Bruni told me. Yeah. yeah. I, I knew that. Yeah. Steve Bruni was his name, Dr. Bruni legendary guy he was a master god i miss him i really do so she talked about being a doctor she's talked about a number of things but now sounds like this horseman thing she was looking at schools where her equestrian expertise i know she was she would, at would, texas yeah she's been yeah. baylor and Austin. various yeah. different yeah yeah and wherever they had a horse program well, they offered she her a full, full scholarship, yeah, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, in Austin. And and now she's going, I don't know if I, I, I kind of like the uh, business aspect. Well, her mother just... Very astute. Oh, it's stunning business Very woman. I'm, I'm blessed. But she went on the tour at Duramax. She saw the business operation. And she saw the complexity of it. Until you've been in an engine engine manufacturing facility as well done as Duramax, you really haven't seen anything yet. So here's this girl. They're going to go look at five schools after that deal at Duramax, which was quite the employee picnic and tour and all that jive. So we got to show off uh, Lockjaw to a That's lot cool. of very interested That's people. That's very cool. It was our way of just saying... Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's which, beautiful. Which we do every so often. That's beautiful. Uh, we go back and we, we meet with the folks. They really appreciate that. Well, I really appreciate them. They, absolutely. I was I, with I, you I, there I, once. Yeah. yeah. One time, yeah. Yeah, wonderful yeah. people at DMAX. When uh, Elizabeth and Sophia left, they were talking, and maybe 10 minutes out, I get a text from Liz, and she says, Sophia just told me she wants to know a lot more about engines. Really? Really? And Elizabeth said, tears came to my eyes. Oh, my. Oh. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, folks, engines are going to be around a lot longer than the social scientists predict. They got to be. Because the social scientists 
this is not science. Don't know the full impact of what they're talking about. And electrification is coming. It, it has a place. But right place. now, if you want to get into electrification, you need a plug-in hybrid. So the C8, the Z06 is coming out. It is a 5.5 liter flat crank, magic looking engine. Uh, Sounds that, like it. That a makes beast. 670 horsepower at like 8,600. 8, uh, yeah, 8,600 RPM. I'm waiting for that one. That's next. <laughs> then they're going to do a version uh, which, which is hybrid, uh, and it'll give you nominally 1,000 horsepower yeah, Corvette, and, and they're going to drive the front wheels electrically. And they're going to call that one the Zora. I've got my Ford GT, not a Mustang. The mid-engine 2005 setup. To me, that's the only car I've ever collected. I'm not a car collector, but I thought, man, that's the most badass car Ford's ever going to build. It's the last of the badass cars that can kill you. There's no nanny state, exactly. traction control, or all the fancy braking and maneuvering and all that jive. You drive the car. And since you drive the car, if you're lame enough, you can kill yourself in the car. Some people go out in, in new cars or new super bikes and immediately kill themselves. So Literally, within blocks of the dealership. Or total the car or total the bike. They're just instantly over their head and don't know it. I, there's another mid-engine car I want to own. I don't, I don't know uh, how it could be leveraged to buy one. But I want to own a Zora. So do I. Yeah. So do I. I mean, if you, yeah. truth be known, yes. That's, that's yeah. what I want. Getting back to the Blackbird 71 engine and that project. Yeah. Ultimately, all the work that was done on that and made it, you know, totally reliable, sustainable, et cetera. Right. And there were some side programs. But uh, I actually ended up in the interim while there were no contracts because it's, you know, government business. I wrote the repair and overhaul manual for the engine for the SR-71 Blackbird. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> Including well repairs and all kinds of oh stuff. Oh, my God. Which was not a, not a very exciting job for me. But <laughs> then they got the program for um, the F-14, which was going to be an aircraft carrier-based airplane. And it was going to be the first turbofan jet engine with a composite first stage compressor oh my god and i got the assignment for that yeah so and i ended up making wooden model i mean you know we did that stuff we we had a wood shop we made wooden things before we made anything Which, out of metal you know isn't the f-14 of the, the aircraft used in, in the first Maverick. top gun well the first top, top gun. gun first top gun yeah because when they went in i didn't know what was going to be in there when they went in that hangar and i saw that damn thing yeah i went nuts right oh, it went <laughs> on the original top gun no the the, the new one well i Have haven't you seen, seen it, it. i'm gonna see it almost gonna say anymore okay but I, yeah, when I'm, i went in there you'll you'll love it i went in, i thought that made me like, holy crap! I was the first engine engineer at Pratt and Whitney on that. I mean, yeah. In de- before it was even developed, right? Yes. Anyway, so I did that, and then um, Garrett, we well, can break there, but no, no, take us to Garrett. Then we lost the SST program. This is kind of interesting because well, the supersonic transport. Yeah, we had uh, Pratt and Whitney was competing for it uh, with GE and a bunch of people yes. for an American version, yes. not the European version, and so we had the preliminary, you know, the. The first stage contracts, concept, preliminary design, concept, etc. Yes. And then because of government funding, they canceled it. So I'm sitting in a engineering office with there could have been forty engineers the way we did it there. Yeah. You know, we had we had desks. We I could see just like I look at you, the rows my were, associate was across. Right. Then there was a row behind me on the wall and another row along the other wall. Right. So everybody knew we lost the contract. So I'm sitting there and it was a dark day. I'm sitting there and the the guy beside me gets a phone call. And he leaves the room. He never comes back, right? <laughs> so then the, the guy behind me or across, he gets, and he goes, he never comes back. Pretty soon I'm sitting there, and there's not many of us left in the room. Yeah. And so that's the day I made the decision to hell with this. I'm not doing any more government contract work. Okay. So Garrett came to town. <laughs> yeah. And they had a, it's a funny story, actually. They had a, they rented a hotel downtown Palm Beach. A guy named Al Silver, who at that time, he owned 17 patents on air bearings. This guy was a really smart guy. Ah. So he was there on the recruiting move. And so Jelana and I got on my Z16 Chevron. We drove down, and she let me out. I went in for the interview. 
this this guy was a crusty old son of a gun. We are in there, and he's like, he's like really grilling me, right? And I'm, I think I'm pretty low key. I don't know, maybe I'm not. Some people say I'm not, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm there, and he's going, he's going, and I finally. I kind of had enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you already owe something. So then I bark back. I bit back, right? Yeah. And so I'm, and it went on for a while. And so we, and the interview's over. So I left. And so I would go down, and John is waiting for me in the car, you know. Oh, how'd it go? And I said, I said, I don't know. I said, that guy either hated me or loved me, and I don't know which. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but I got the job. Yeah. But then he must have loved yeah. you. So I ended up back in the jet engine business because. But nobody was hiring for turbos in those days. I mean, nobody believed in them like you and I did. Yep. Garrett did it because Caterpillar made them. That's, yes. I mean, that's the historical yes. thing of the number one turbocharger okay. company in the Garrett world. Garrett was making jet engines. Mm-hmm. Caterpillar, extremely smart. They're R&D people, always on the leading edge in yeah. my life experience. Yes. There was a guy there that I ended up meeting. They call him R-Cube. His name was Rex R. Robinson the third or something. Yeah. But everybody called him Mark and he ran the R and D. Okay. Got it. I mean, he and I we interacted a few times. So, so they made a turbo in their own laboratory and Garrett was very expert, especially in small jet engines. They never made big like Blackbird engines or anything like right. that. All small scale. Yeah. I mean they did a lot of work with like business jets. Yeah. Yeah. So they sent the turbo to Garrett to do a critical design review. This was in very middle 1950s, early 1950s. Got it. And so Garrett did the critical design review and sent them back a report, what they thought about it, and good, bad, otherwise, it could mm-hmm. be different. And so then Caterpillar said, we really want one, and we want you to make it for us. So Caterpillar essentially put Garrett in the turbo, turbo business. Machine, yeah, into the turbocharger business. So the first one is Man, that that's a hell of a backstory right yeah. there. The first one, I think, in those days, because they were so committed to getting more power out of the diesel with more de- more pounds of air, yeah, meaning density in the same cubic volume, yeah, that they basically funded Garrett to get into business because they considered them the experts to do it. That's remarkable. Yeah. So that's a whole whole history. I wonder where Louis Schwitzer was at that time. They were messing around, but see, they because they were a lot closer to. In Peoria, right? Then you, yeah, then but you see, were. At, but Garrett Engineering sophistication is there's no comparison. I understand. That. I mean, I knew Bill Woolenweber, who was the head of, he was the chief engineer at Switzer. We were friendly adversaries, or not so friendly, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Because Garrett Caterpillar would always, they had to strategic. They play uh, against. They had to strategic dictate that they would never buy more than fifty percent of their turbochargers from one company. Uh huh. We'll save that because yeah, that, that's, that's that's how I got. We'll save. You gotta that. save. That. You gotta. That, but you came. That, that's you a, came. That's the beginning you, of a twenty-two you, year career. You, Garrett, you, so. you you went to the recruiting thing in, and I got in the Palm job. Beach. You got the job and you came to California. That was in October of '68, and I was still doing the F one hundred engine for the F fourteen, and so they kept saying, "Okay, you got the job when you're coming," and I kept. Saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to be there in a little while. I just want to finish this thing, right? Yeah. So finally, they sent me an edict. If you aren't here by January 1st, 69, you don't have the job. Got it. I got there on January 1st. Thank uh, you. Did you really? <laughs> but I finished my project. Ah. No, I, I just. On the F-14. Right, my part of it. I mean, it was a right. small part. It yeah. It was the very beginning. Yes. But, but at least I I got to do it. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be watching for the F-14 you gotta tomorrow, go. tomorrow night. You got That whole scene, you'll love it. Some of my friends have seen You know the how they start those. Some of my friends have seen Top Gun Maverick four times. Do you know how they start the engine, right? Do you know what they used? No. I think you do. Buick 455 Wildcat. Oh, that was the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually. I know uh, you know about that. Yeah. it's. I think we've talked about this. I think they used a, a nail head. I don't know that it's exactly 455 cubic inches. It was a big old Buick engine. Yes, but it was a Buick V8. I'm pretty sure it's earlier one. Yeah, it was earlier than that. Yeah, because that the the one I'm talking about was We're in my station about earlier wagon. 60s. I'm remembering the one in my station wagon. Like what year was Matt that? Has. 60s? No, 80s, 70s, somewhere in there. God, I bought it because yeah. I had three kids and I wanted them essentially in an armored what? vehicle. Yeah, you know, the, so I had Jelana and my three kids in his whatever five or six thousand pound station wagon. <laughs> right, a, a, a big Buick Roadmaster, a Buick yeah. Roadmaster with so, uh, wood paneling on the side. Yeah, so that nail head was the ground support, the starting unit. 
That's right. was driven by a Buick nailhead V8. So called because the valve stood straight up and down, and the valve covers, the ceiling surface was dead horizontal. You have these long, thin valve covers. Cool. Tommy Ivo put four of them in a Tommy Ivo. Yeah, in an all-wheel drive dragster, slicks all around, and God, what a showman! One last thing at Pratt and Whitney, though, because Liz and Broody and the kids are down there all the time. Yeah, near uh, what's called Alligator Alley. I was never a rich kid, right? I mean, I never had a car until I was able to buy my own when I got a job. Yeah. So I had this Z16 Chevelle, right, that I bought when I was working on offshore oil rigs. So there's like a rich kid at Pratt and Whitney. I still never forget this guy. He was kind of a fancy guy, I guess. And he, uh, his name was Bert Norris. And he had Porsches, and he did SCCA racing and all yeah. this stuff, you know. He was a, he was a hot dog. Yeah. Right? Anyway, sure. I have my little Chevy Chevelle, right? <laughs> so then the damn guy went, and we worked night shifts together a lot of times. So then he went and bought a Ferrari 330 GT. Mm. And then one night we're working night shift, and he's saying something. I mean, he was kind of like egging me on. Yeah. And I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Are you going to run the Chevelle against a Ferrari? Against her Ferrari 330. Yeah. Oh, guess what? After we're all done, you know, I'm going, and I see him, and pretty soon he's fading, and pretty soon, way down, I pull over, and he comes up, and he said, he says, how fast are you going? He said, I quit at 147. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I don't know, the speed only goes to 160. Yeah. Because this I had. Is, this is a 375 horse 396. Or a 425. Quote, quote, B stock. That's why it's 375. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they so were it could run B stock. So the bottom line it was the same as the 425 they, engine in the Corvette. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. And mine was not stock. <laughs> so, so that 396. Why did they ever do that? Well, everybody was trying to guess what displacement NASCAR was going to use for the upcoming season. Season. And uh, some thought six and a half liters which is three nice some thought seven liters which is 427 uh so a lot of people did 427s gm covered both they did the 396 and the 427 yeah and it ended up being 427 yeah but they only built 200 of the one i got i know i mean i but, have i still have it so. you know there's a term i've heard homologation or something like that yeah. you got to build enough of them that you could race them in nascar they weren't just that, one-offs. That car's done the deed across this country. From, it's a freaking legendary. <laughs> the Bayou to it's Florida. It's a legendary to, uh, setup for Chevy. And you know what's here's, where we're, here's where we're yeah. going, folks. Obviously, we got to Garrett. You're at Garrett now. Uh, I had to get that race in with a and Ferrari. It's, and it's <laughs> I mean, January the 1st of 1969. Yep. So we've got it all in yep. time frame. I've been screwing with... With Ram turbo, Air. I, I, yeah, <laughs> and, and started with the turbocharging in 1969 with the Ray J product, uh, which was TRW. You know, I started doing a marine engine twin turbo char- charge air cooled setup. Jerry rigged one together. Uh, I was running at, uh, had two E Flow Ray J's on it, and we had done our own thing with the turbine housings on those. Ultimately, did water cooled versions of them. But I was on the dyno over in Fox Hills on Ryan Faulkner's dyno. Over I know there. Ryan. And, oh, well, another genius. Oh, yeah, Herb Fischel yeah. introduced me. Ryan's yeah. just a very impressive guy. Anyhow, I'm on his dyno, and, you know, Ryan's going, Jack, uh, English Jack was his assistant guy on the dyno, and he goes, hey, Jack, had a 500 pound big Toledo scale. Oh, yeah, the way that you read through the window. And uh, to get the torque, and then you knew the RPM so you could compute the horsepower. So he says, eh, this thing's probably going to do more than 500 pound-feet. Uh, Jack, put 200 pounds of back weight on it. So it, now it reads like 200 to 700. We fire it up. I says, load it up about 4,000 RPM. And he loads it up and runs it right off the end scale. of the scale. Yeah, it pins the, the clock, so to speak. So he says, Jack. Put another 100 on there, 800, runs it off the end. He says, put 200 more. Now it's 1,000. Full reading just goes off the end. And and he turns to me and he says, that looks like about 1,020. I said, eh, let's call it 1,018. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. He brings it back down, lets it idle a little bit and cuts it. And I go, 
I'm going to call Ray J over, over in Long Beach. So I call Ray J, and I get Hugh McInnes on the phone. He yeah. was their chief engineer right. there. Right. He had come from the TRW program right. from the, the Corvair, Corvair Spider. and he's is a guy who went out on the line at 2 in the morning. He got a call uh, from the assembly plant. Hey, we're having trouble with these turbo Corvairs. So he gets out of bed, suits up, goes down there, goes out on the line. What's the problem? Windshield. We're having a hard time fitting the windshields into these turbo Corvairs. <laughs> he goes, well, what the hell am I doing here? Oh, They're blowing them out. Well, they're turbo. You know, it's like, what? It has nothing it's to not do like with the turbocharger, <laughs> but they call the turbo guy because it's different. This this car is turbocharged. <laughs> It's like, you oh, got to be God. kidding me. <laughs> Hugh told me that story shortly oh, after man. I met him, and he says... That's something else. You know, you've, you're selling these uh, <laughs> turbo engines. People don't understand the turbo. If there's any problem, they, you know, like misfire or it, it plugs anything. or dirty, whatever, they're going to blame the turbocharger. The, the dealers just, did that. Oh, yeah. And the OEM does that. Just be ready for it. I, cause I it, live that. It life. has to be that. It's different. and It's like... People lose their common sense. And I, I don't know, back in the day, yeah, I took those calls, and I would, would tell them, pretend the turbo is not there. Now, what would you diagnose the problem to be? Well, yeah, I might need some ignition work. I said, there you go. Because the turbocharger is still operating, still spinning. There's nothing wrong with it. Next time you diagnose a turbo engine, don't forget your naturally aspirated knowledge and start there. I know. I've been through so much of that. Gary, so he was the one who clued me in. So the phone call goes like this. I've got this 7.4 liter engine. It might have been a 427. I, you know, this is going way back. And I'm on the dyno over here at Ryan Faulkner's. I want to get rid of some of the power. And it's a floating match. There's no wastegates. Floating. I don't want to put wastegates in a saltwater marine engine because I'm afraid it's they'll stick. Yeah, I don't want them sticking and closed if I need, it, need them to open. And yeah, I've been around marine engines and worked on mm. boats since the fifth, uh, early 50s. My dad, my brother, and I built a little, little Chris craft. We got the plans and built the boat. And Not this, was it the 16-foot Cuddy Cabin? Because uh, that that was always in popular mechanics. Yeah, I, think, I always wanted to build yeah, that. Yeah, with a little Chrysler Ace engine. Yeah, yeah. yeah we yeah. built that. Yeah. Uh, and took it to Catalina. Imagine a high school kid with a boat in Catalina. Were there any you, high school girls tie, there? Oh, there were college <laughs> girls there. You tie it up and swim in and oh, yeah. lay on the beach with the, all the chicks and start talking to one of them and yeah. how, well how'd you get here oh i came over on the ferry in my boat <laughs> yeah yeah how'd you get here oh, on that boat right out there oh you're lying to me yeah. no you want to go that's for really ride? your boat <laughs> can we go out to your boat mm. can, you, can swim? you give me a ride to the boat you know it's like oh baby that gets you in trouble real quick yeah. so we're going to get heavily into garrett turbocharging and all the places a turbocharger could go and when we first met, right, at Ack Miller's when, Garage. And when we first met and how that all played um, out. The 70s for us was boats. We weren't doing a lot of automobiles. The 70s for Walt was was automobiles, race cars Caterpillar. of all types. <laughs> Caterpillar uh, is a wonderful story. How you saved the, the Garrett part Oh, that's, part that's of, the Ford Power Stroke in Navistar. Well, there's that, uh, too. But yeah. I'm talking about Cat. You living uh, in Peoria, what, two uh, years or so? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we will be doing episode two, and we will probably be doing episode three. And it, it'll be heavy into turbocharging and racing all, all over the place. How Walt's product helped me to a modicum of fame. It did, indeed. It truly and did. And you deserve it. Well, I don't know you if deserve I deserve it. it. I d- yes, you I, you do. Know. Yes, you do. Uh, few people have done what you've done. So, very few. How many companies of any nature, public listed or otherwise, are 60, what, two years old now? You know? uh, Is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to give you our story working together in an era war that was no turbocharging going on through the 70s, into the 80s, 
virtually all the way through the 80s. And now, ending your work at Garrett, virtually w- with the turbochargers for Buick, especially the gr- GNX, the Grand National. Right, for the car people, and the power stroke for the truck people. Yeah, and that, you, you, that you, the power, the, the, the turbocharger you developed for the Ford Power Stroke, that'd be the 7.3. Right, Z-axis turbo. You revolutionized turbo manufacturing with that pub. We actually did. I can't wait to talk about that. So stay tuned, folks. We'll be back. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes of Speed School with Dale Banks.